the Inner Game Podcast. Brought to you by the Science of Excellence. Presented by Rob Hume, the leading elite athlete mental performance coach. Unleash your power. Boom. So welcome on to the Inner Game podcast, Alan Tong. Uh, thank you very, very much for coming on and giving up your time. Today um, on the show, we have somebody who has certainly experienced the, the highs and lows, the challenges of being in elite sport as a, as a professional footballer, being at Man United, being at Exeter. Um, and um, yeah, today we, we, we're going to speak with Alan about about his story, his journey, and about how sport uh, kind of shaped him, his life, and, and how the mental challenges he faced affected him and, 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 and the, the coping strategies and techniques that you kind of use to help get you beyond some of those. So, so thanks a lot, Alan, for, for coming on. No, no worries, Rob. Great to, great to be on. Thanks for inviting me. So if it's okay with you, I'd like to rewind... Rewind time. How how did uh, how did how did how did your life in, in in football start for you? How did you first get get drawn into the, that that beautiful game that we all love called football? Probably like a lot of people, Rob. Really, um, you know, interest from me dad. I think more than more than I can remember. Uh, you know, lots of. Lots of playing in the park when I was a youngster, playing in the garden. My dad sort of made some nets for me and uh, sort of be, be involved in games that always seem to have drama in them, you know, like using sort of, you know, almost almost like this imagery sometimes, you know, creating scenarios where you need a last minute goal to win a cup final or yeah. you need a late goal to win, you know, a major tournament. And, uh, you know, there was there was loads of different things that, that sort of like were played out like that. But, yeah, I just just a just a sort of like a love really that like a lot of young people have. We're kicking a ball about, and you know, and every time you know we went on holiday or, or places, there'd always be a post going with us and a and a football. And yeah, you know, as, as as soon as you get out the car or you know you, you you're looking for a patch of grass where you can set something up, and you know that was kind of my early my really early memories of. Yeah. Of, uh, of of football, Rob. Yeah. Um, um, and what about then you, you, your transition, kind of from that sort of foundation um, stage, if you like, into then you know being involved with with, with Manchester United. How um, you know at what age did you start being part of, of, of the club, and and um, um, what age did you kind of chat to there? Yeah. You know, kind of. Uh, Finish. Well, I had um, like a lot of young people. My probably my earliest experiences of football was was through the grassroots system, yeah. and that and be right through till I was about you know till I was under sixteen actually, Rob. But you know you could you could play for United's B team, which was the sort of the junior side that they had back then, and train with United. But you could also train with your grand side as well, and yeah. You know, you, you reflect on these things and you think, I was playing an awful lot of football, Rob, as a kid. You yeah. know, I, I was involved with, like, Monday night, I'd be at United. Tuesday night, I'd be training with the school team, maybe four till five. Wednesday night, I'd be training with my grassroots club, Bolton Lads Club, I was playing with at the time. That'd be, like, seven till nine or seven till half eight. Back with United on a Thursday night. Friday night, I got a bit of a breather. And then, and then Saturday morning, I'd probably be involved with United's B team or the school side. And then on a Sunday, I'd be playing for my, my grassroots team. Yeah. So, so you, you know, you look at you look at the football kind of side to it and from, you know, me being about eight or nine years old, coming right through to 16, I was, I was playing an awful lot, to be fair. And, you know, maybe that, maybe that was to, maybe to my detriment in, in some respects. But, but yeah, I, I was playing in grassroots for a long time, you know, right through from under 11s, right through till, you know, like I say, the under 16s and, Went through a, a couple of a couple of representative sides as well. I was representing my town, Bolton Bolton School Boys. So we used to play, you know, like local local size Oldham, 
team side and yeah. played Liverpool boys and so I was I was involved with that and I got a goals to play for my represent my county as well Greater Manchester oh. so you you tap your town side off to Bolton and then your county side was kind of the best area so that that was really good experiences and yeah. and it was in the county game that uh, I think I first came to to sort of, of scouts really um, I was I was uh, uh, approached or my mum and dad was approached after by a lad called Joe Brown he was the youth development manager at the time didn't he invited me down for an extended Christmas period and uh, I think I went down to the cliff we used to meet at the cliff at uh, at Lower Bro, uh, I think it was on something like the 28th of December. And it was <laughs> that place. I stayed over about four or five days, right into like the early parts of the New yeah. Year. So like, yeah, I stayed over on New Year's Eve as a 14-year-old, like in the in the halls of residence in, but I think it was. Yeah. Uh, all with training and a couple of practice matches and stuff like that. But it, yeah, it was it was really really uh, exciting and and following that. Trial, Rob. They, they said like we'd like to offer you a schoolboy for, well, and an apprenticeship, like a um, dream come true for myself because all my family were United fans. I was a United supporter, and uh, you know I had a couple of other teams uh, after after me as well at the time. I like Bolton wanted me to sign Matt with right. Man City. And I think I had a couple of trials at other sides as well. I've been. I think I went down to Port Vale, and so a few a few little sides there around the area were sort of like clamouring. You know, to see if I'd join. Yeah. When United come knocking, I think like maybe maybe it was my heart really in my head. <laughs> Looking at that and the early experiences, but you know, who, who's going to knock that back at fourteen like an opportunity to join them? It, it doesn't really come al- uh, along very often. No, like it'd be one of those if you took if you took one of the other ones. Yeah. You'd be starting out probably looking back, going, "Why did I, Why did I not go for that?" Wouldn't you? Yeah, that's it, and you just. You know, whether it was there, I think that's it. If I could pass any sort of like advice onto youngsters, and that would be just look at it more from a holistic perspective. Like, how many first team players, how many youngsters they get through into the first team? How do they, how do they treat the youngsters? Do you get opportunities? And maybe just, maybe just ask a few questions first. But I was almost like, right, where's the pen? Like, sorry, <laughs> without, without, without thinking about anything. Yeah. You know, maybe, maybe to my detriment, I think, I think maybe like, you know, in hind- everything's easy in hindsight, Rob, isn't it, when you look back? But, it is. You know, it may, may be like, you know, it was it was brilliant and fantastic, but there was a lot of tough times with it as well. So, um, yeah, it, it was it, it was interesting. And, um, and then what? how long did you then stay uh, with Manchester United for? Yeah, so I, I was there. I joined uh, just, just short of my 15th birthday, so I was... I was I was 14 when I signed, so I had like a couple of years schoolboy with them. And then I did like my two years. It was like apprentice then. And uh, I got, after my apprentice finished, they offered me a one-year uh, professional contract. Yeah. Uh, I think back then, Robert, it used to really, a lot of it determined on how the youth team were doing. You know, I think that was kind of the big the big thing. Like if the, if the youth team did all right, you know, they tended to offer a few lads like an opportunity. Yeah. But uh, again... From a perspective of like no agents back then or anything like that. And they said to me, like, we'll give you one year contract. And and you're thinking, like, you know, maybe on reflection, you know, we maybe should have held your ground and said, like, can they have like a two year, you know, just to give you that opportunity to really try and develop. Yeah. It's like one year, you just like pressures on straight away. And, yeah. uh, you know, but it's like, again, you're just thinking, right, well, give us the pen, yeah, pro deal and all that. And, then, you know, looking back, you're probably thinking, you know, it wasn't a thing to do at the time, but. We did that, I got a year deal, and then I got to the end of that, and then probably the actually, uh, body blow, um, like, got called in Alex Ferguson, and he said, uh, going to have to move you on, going to have to let you go, and, uh, you know, he, he, that was kind of my, sort of my time up there. So, you know, yeah. I, I played in the resis, I got, played in a couple of, like, first-team friendlies, but to be honest with you, Rob, I just lack that something to get into the that, that net. People say the difference between academy reserves and freeze now and the first team it, it, it is big it's probably bigger than you think and yeah and uh it's very competitive as we know and you know i just maybe just lack that something to to sort of push me on to the next level but you know it's like it's all chances isn't it you need opportunities yeah. to show yeah. what you can do and if if opportunities don't arise 
you know, you're not you're not ever given that platform, are you? And yeah. you know, you, you look at football teams in the modern day, it's like the, the it's like there's so many players within squads and twenty yeah. threes and eighteens and sixteens. Yeah. And you, you're hearing teams have got shadow squads, elite development yeah. squads, elite development reserve squads, and it's like it's mad, like the number of players is incredible and to to get through all the way into a first team and yeah. And, and stay in a first team, you know, that, you know, people who can do it, you know, they, they are exceptional. And, uh, you know, the, the data tells us, Rob, that not a lot of people manage to do it. No, the, the, the net nowadays, more so <laughs> when you and I were playing as kids, is just cast so much wider, isn't it? And yeah. um, once, you know, you get in to that academy system in some aspects, obviously, as a young lad or girl, you know, you start dreaming, don't you? <laughs> That's right. You know, dreams are fantastic. You've got to have an element of it. It's difficult because you sometimes you have to go through experiences yeah. to, to bring you out the other side, if that makes sense. Because yeah. I remember, Rob, when I was an apprentice, like people would be coming into us saying, you know, you've got to think of this, you've got to think of financial situations, you've got to think. And you're like, they're just going in one ear and out the other because you're thinking... Well, I'll be I'll be a football star on thirty five, and I'll have a think about it then, you know. And it, it's just, you know, anything can happen at any time. You know, it's very it's very insecure industry. Yeah, it's an industry that you can uh, be in the shop window one week, and then uh, a few months down the line, you can be like in a completely different scenario. But you know, it's all these are all these are sent to us, Rob, to test us. You yeah. know, it's like destiny sometimes, and yeah, you know, and. Uh, it, it was, uh, yeah, it was, it was a, but it was tough because you know I think one of the hardest things in life, Rob, is when you don't see things coming. Yeah. I'd, I'd, had a, I'd had a reasonably good season, and um, I played in a game right at the end of the season. We just picked Man City's one of Man City's sides to the title. I think it was their A team to yeah. win it by a point. And after the game, like Fergie sort of said to us, like, "Oh, you've done really well this morning. You, you know, you, uh, you you've played, you've played really well." They had a lad like going back a number of years now on the left wing for City's A team called. Jason Beckford, and he'd been in and out the first team. And you're thinking to yourself, oh, that sounds all right, like, because I knew contracts are going to be coming up soon. Yeah. So you're like, that's happening on Saturday morning. And then you're getting called in Tuesday, Wednesday of the week after and saying, like, oh, we're going to move you on. And, uh, you know, it's like, it's to go from sort of like, you know, really having like a lot of high and a lot of winning the title and, you know, fantastic. And then you're thinking a few days later, I don't know where my future is going to be. Yeah. You know, and it's that's like sort of up to down sort of thing within a, a quick movement like you're at the top of the slide and then within a few seconds you're at the bottom of it and uh, you know you're like looking at that and you're thinking like running through my mind I talk about psychology earlier Rob it's like you're thinking about what am I going to do now like where am I going to go Yeah. And, uh, what am I going to say to people because they're ultimately going to be asking me like well, how are you doing and all that as you do and, and I think I think I got into myself I got myself into a situation there where uh, I just I just I suppose I was a little bit. I didn't want to speak to people. Yeah, you'd see people in the village where I lived, you know, because it's only a small village, and I'd be crossing the road because I know they'd be saying like, "How, how are you getting on? What, what are you up to?" And you know, yeah. and I didn't want to say to them, "I'm not there anymore." And oh. so I, I used to kind of like dive over the road, or like I'd, I'd see somebody in a shop or something, and I'd think to myself, "I'll just hang fire till they've gone out and all that." And oh. so you're thinking like about my mental health and stuff like that. Like yeah. my, that time must have been really bad because yeah, you know, I'm, I'm I'm almost in a sort of a a situation here where you're thinking like you've gone from being involved with like a top club to like a month or two later you don't even want to speak to anybody and you know it's like up, up, ups and downs so so yeah it was uh, it was that was a really tough time in my life yeah I can imagine it's one one of the things that that I you know really believe which um, I believe that you know all athletes who have made it to an elite level, whatever level that might be, you know, there's levels within levels, isn't there? But once you've got to an elite level like you did, and even if you'd carried on, and even if you then went and had an amazing career, in sport, that career ends, doesn't it? <laughs> it doesn't matter who you are. Ronaldo is, is exception. It is going to end. I don't think it's going to end as soon as what some people think because that guy has, has got something in him that very, very, very few athletes of any kind have got but it will end from him and <laughs> as 
I know what I was like. I, I, I used to be, as a young kid, you know, quite shy and introvert. I didn't have a lot of confidence, didn't have a lot of extrovert within me. Mm-hmm. But it changed because of the game, the game of football. It, I then became good at something for the first time in my life. People start praising you, people start noticing you, and you feel good. Yeah. You know, I did. And, but then when that goes, you, you, you kind of create, you start creating your identity around that, don't you? Yeah, yeah. And then when you, you know, for yourself especially, who went way, way higher than what, than what I did, you know, as you say, one day you, when you're saying to yourself or if somebody asks you, you know, oh, well, if they didn't know you, they might ask you what do you do. And you, you say, I'm a footballer. On one day, that day before Fergie spoke to you, that was the answer, wasn't it? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. The day after that, and after that conversation, when somebody then asks you, there's no answer, is there? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was tough because um, it's like it's like I say, you, you're sort of like, you, you know, you, you, you're doing okay and stuff like that, and then within, you know, the space of a sort of a few sentences... I think, I think in my PhD, I kind of wrote a little bit about the experience and it was like almost like you're facing somebody off in like a sort of a... I described it as like for a gun to finger thing and for, for moving you on. And it's like stood there and it's like your body kind of caves in a little bit. You're thinking to yourself, like, what do you react to? And do you beg him for another chance? Do you start crying? Do you, do you just swallow your pride and just say, you know, all these things are going through your mind at the time. And uh, you know, I think I think all it is is it's, it's because you like, you just it's your critical moments, isn't it? You say you don't know what to do. So I just said, like, you know, thanks for the opportunity for you know giving me this uh, this fantastic club, and you just deal with it with as best as humility as as you can, and and uh, you know, fo- following that experience, it's like you're just lost to be honest, because you, you're not sure where you're going to be going now. You know, the club said. We've got we've got a couple of clubs that we might be able to sort of like you know sort you out with and stuff like that. But unfortunately, in football, when you when you're out of sight, you're out of mind. You kind yeah. of like once you walk out those training ground gates for the last time, you think that you think the phone's going to be ringing and red hot and stuff like that. And then you give it a week or two, and you think like no, like no one's getting in touch. Here. I'm going to have to like start initiating stuff myself. So yeah. you know, these are like before the days of agents, Rob. And you're like I'm ringing like. Macclesfield Town and Oldham and Bolton, you know, we have a look at us and, you know, you're having to sort of like, you know, force your own sort of destiny in a way. And, uh, you know, and it's just never think that being United, coming away from United, communities elsewhere, but, um, you know, it's like anything else. I've likened it to that, Rob, when your time's up and you and you moved on, you're like, it's like you're thrown away like an empty crisp packet. That's how it feels like you've done your bit. I've, tra- I've, tra- I've turned up, I've trained hard, I've represented myself in the best way I can, I've played in the youth team, played in the music and then like, but we're not gonna, you're not going to get to the first team level, so we're going to move you on now. And that, that's how you feel as though you, you feel as though like your worth's kind of like, well, you didn't have any worth, to be honest with you. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> again, it's back into this period of history, uh, very, very different in football clubs back then. The culture was, was very, very different. You know, I heard your your interview with Andy last week yeah. in relation to you know listening to Andy describe. It, I think at, at Bolton as a young player, yeah, and, uh, the the atmosphere and the culture wasn't very nice at the time. You know, you in in the modern day because we do a little bit of work in in the university I work at at the moment on player care and well being. It's poles apart in in the modern modern. I'm not saying it's hundred percent right now. Yeah. Well, back then, it was like there wasn't hardly anything. Some of the practices were poor. The ethics were poor. And you're in the middle of that. And you're thinking, you know, when you came into United as a kid and you started full time, it surprised me. I didn't think it was going to be like what it was, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, there was a lot of bullying, a lot of hierarchical stuff. Yes. Yeah. A lot, a lot of scapegoating, a lot of tough coaching. You know, the, the coaches weren't... Uh, you know, they, they weren't scared of letting you know what they felt, and that could be quite brutal, especially in front of other people. You know, lots of expletives and bad language and going nose-to-nose with people. And, you know, this is a group of under-18s. They're not 
not mid years pros or something like and no you're still children aren't you it, it, it is it, it's not right in a way and, and you know you, you you look at like there's a little bit of a touch on it in Ollie Kay's book he wrote a, a book about a teammate of mine called Edie Doherty who was who was destined for stardom and it, it, again you talk about destiny it didn't quite work out for him but in Ollie's book he, he draws on he spoke to quite a few people who were around Adrian at the time and and you talk about it Rob where you've got training ground practices, dressing room practices, but stuff in digs as well, you know, with players like moving in with families and stuff. And like not nice, not nice stuff to go through. Yeah. Uh, you know, some people say, well, it toughens you up, it brings you on and stuff like that. But for me, it's like, well, there's other ways you can bring people on. You don't have to go to the extreme sometimes. And, you know, and um, for, it was a real weird situation because you're in a club that you love. Yeah. That's not really what I thought it was going to be, and you, you know, it's like anything else. It's sport, Rob. It's like it's a relationship you have with somebody. Yeah, it is. And when when the relationship breaks down, mm. you know, that doesn't say that you still don't love the place that you're at. You know, I've, I've been loving United since I was like four or five year old, and you know, you you never you never throw that away, and and you just you just hold on to your dignity. You know, a lot of players who've been released, they'd be taking training kits and. Uh, boots and all that and you know like helping the cells and it that to me I, I drew the line on that because that wasn't who I was as a person yeah you know, I, I love Man United I wasn't going to go and like start nicking everything and all that and yeah uh, you know I think I think that's it that's all I could do at the at the time that is just just be who I was just to, yeah. you know go down on work, one knee take your counter nine and then think about you know where's where's my life going to take me next yeah I mean, yeah, it's certainly saying some really, you know, really powerful things there, Alan. And it's, you know, the experiences that I've had and, the, and people that I know and students that I've taught over the years. Uh, and one of the reasons why I, I set up this athlete mentoring business was, was genuinely because of that, because I knew um, that young boys, you know, and young girls, um, weren't getting the, the care uh, and respect that they deserved, you know, at times whilst they was in the system of football, but also when they, when they were then out of it, you know, and what people outside of sport don't realise is that, you know, when you're 14, 15, 16, doing the things that you were doing, it, it was a job almost. It wasn't you know you go into school, but it's a job. You know, yeah. it's only the athletes. You know, the sport. You know, at school sort of age, that really experience that. You know, they go to school, then you live a completely different life outside of that. And you know, the, these, especially football clubs, but not just football, it's other sports as well. They, they have the lives of young people in their hands and. Yeah, fair enough. If somebody isn't good enough, you know, that that, that, that is life, isn't it? You know, um, yeah, there's still things that that can be done to to ease that process, you know. Um, and and there were certainly things that needed to be done in and around your era, you know, before it and after it to create that culture that allows talent and ability to flourish. Um, and, and that just wasn't happening in lots of different ways, was it? Uh, you know, and, and I remember watching the Class of 92 documentary and they all spoke about it, you know, how they'd be, they'd be chucked in the in the washing machine and the tumble dryer and these types of things. And, like, it's almost as if, like, in that era, it was just a battle for the only the strongest will survive. We're going to put so much physical and mental and emotional pressure on you. And it, it, it wasn't going to necessarily be the most talented people that came out of that. It was those that had just by accident had the inner strength and capabilities to cope with all of that. You know, and at the end of it, you might get somebody that managed to, to be strong enough to get through to the first team. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, th I think what the Class of 92 probably had that maybe a lot of groups pre them and maybe after them, to be honest, what Rob is, they, they had each other as a group to yeah. look after. They had about six or seven who come through to the first team like them and lads who went on to have good careers as well outside of that. Whereas youth teams and who's come through, 
get two or three coming out of it and, the, and you're a little fractured, if that makes yeah. sense. Yeah. The class of 92 had a good solid group to cling to and pull, pull each other through and, you know, that maybe would be one of the differentials. And But, uh, yeah, you, you're right. You know, you read any autobiographies of the time and it's all referred to, you know, Robbie Savage spoke about it, Gary Neville spoke about it. I think it's been on in, in the media referring to some of the practices that, that went on as a as a as a rites of passage sort of thing. Yeah. And uh, you know, some some of the stuff is, you know, you you safeguarding and you youth, you know, protection, child protection and stuff like that. And a lot of it was, you know, you talk about lines that are drawn in the sand and and arguably they're going beyond those lines, some of it, and you know, it wasn't the best of times, to be honest. And uh I think I think it was kind of stamped out 92, 93. You know, somebody complained about it and bang, it was gone. But, you know, leading up to that, I don't know where it had come from. I don't know where these cultural practices had ingrained themselves into environments like that. But again, it's just not football, obviously. You hear the stuff like in the military where Sergeant Majors have been treating young recruits not the best. And, you know, it's like rites of passage and brings you on. But, um, you know, some, some of the... Some of the practices are not not the best, to be fair. No, no. Um, so eventually, you, you obviously did. You, you did. You were able to re, rebuild to some degree, weren't you, Alan? And, and mm-hmm. then you dropped down a, a little bit, and then you ended up at Exeter. Is, is this is this correct? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so I come out United, and um, I was like struggling to get a club for a, a little while. I think I went down to Bolton for a bit on trial. Didn't quite work out. I felt they had something against me because I knocked them back at 15. So it makes you wonder, like, you know, we got Alan Tongi. He said, no, so there's no chance we're going to, we're going to any 15. So I went to a team, HRMI, who was like in a non league, just to sort of keep my fitness up and, and uh, you know, keep keep sort of play a few matches and, you know, keep me keep me match fitness together. And, uh, you know, follow, following that, I ended up at uh, going down to Exeter, which is, you know, quite a trek really for a month. Yeah. It's yeah. like, doorstep Exeter and and uh you know and I think I think what what's really bizarre at that time Rob is um be, because there was no agents or anything like that I think it was an, a, a neighbor who got me that like a trial at Exeter because it, the manager was Alan Ball at the time oh and, uh, yeah and, and he, he knew Alan Ball was a farmer flood so I lived in like the next village along and uh I think he phoned Alan Ball up at Exeter and said you know Alan Tong's like do, and I think Bowley was aware because he said he, he he watched a few resi games I was in. And and when I was a young lad at 17, I went to Russia with a football league party and Alan Ball and Laurie McMenemy were the managers. Right. And uh, he, he also kind of remembered me from that as well. So they invited me down and then uh, I got down to Exeter. I think it was like December nine, December 1991, I think, and stayed there till 94. So I had like three seasons with Exeter. Right. So all that all that way and like you're sort of thinking you know is it going to work out and they ended up staying down there for I think it was about three three or four seasons something like that so yeah it was good uh, managed to, I managed to get in the first team down there and played played a few first team games and that so so you're thinking like like you're getting moving again you know yeah. you're starting to get a little bit of reward for your hard work and and uh, but unfortunately it wasn't to be another I got another critical moment to deal with I had a really picked up a really bad injury uh, I mean, back was absolutely in bits. Uh, had to have screw- ended up with two operations, screws and plates in it. So I was, I was fin- finished at 22. I, it was all over for me. Um, so uh, I think I think I think that fo- football, I think, was not meant to be my destiny. Rob, to be honest, no. no. You know, it, it's like you talk about the ups and downs. I had a lot of great times in football, and you know, first played in the first team exit scored in the first so you you know, you've played in the football league, you realise the dream. You know, signed for United, played played in the resis, played in a first team friendly forum. So some great stuff, but some like real downs as well. Like yeah. and, you know, the deselection experience and the injury experience. They were two powerful things that have left I think quite a bit of scar and and uh, you know coming away from that. You know, you look you look back with it's just part of life's tapestry, Rob, and it like like everybody, life's journey. Yeah. Everybody has different experiences, and all, all you can try and do as a human being is just try and work them out, and you know, they and try and try, try and 
get some clarity from them and move on from them and learn from them. And, yeah. you know, that, that, that's, that's, that's how it happened for me. Definitely. Uh, a couple of things I'd like to touch on there. One is just uh, actually about your, you know, your back and spine injury. How did that, that come about? You mentioned at the start, like how much football you was playing. Was that anything to do with it? Was it just, or was that completely yeah. separate to it? When the when the surgeon sort of like went in to have a look and like spine up, he, he said he said I was born with a piece of bone missing in my back. As right, said that if I'd have had if I'd have had 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 a sedentary job yeah. where I'd like just gone into office work or you know something, he said probably wouldn't have known anything about that. No. But because you've been playing a lot of football and training over the years, like it's like a rock, isn't it? It's like a rock where you get a lot of water on it and then it wears away, wears away, and it's going to crumble, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, I think that it come to an extent where uh, I was starting to get pins and needles in my legs and my arms and my feet. Oh. And I always knew I was, I always knew there was something not quite right. But yeah. You know what typical blokes are like because they've been brought up in a map environment, map to environment, United, all that hierarchy. So if you like, you think you've missed a tough, don't you? Yeah. So I thought to myself, well, I'll be all right. I'll just keep playing, you know. And, and I think I thought to myself, in a few weeks, it'll die away the pain. I'll get over it, you know. And, and it, I was just stupid. I um, played up at Swansea City. And after the game, I'd like, I was in bits after. And I thought, like, I was just stupid for playing. Like, and I, said, I went to the physio and uh, he said to me, like, we better go and get you scanned and that. And it, my back was in a bit of a mess, to be fair. Yeah. Uh, I needed screws and plates in there. Gosh. And they said they said to me, surgeon, like he said, if like you've had one bad tackle in that game, could have ended up in a wheelchair because he said your discs had slipped, and every time you was like moving in a certain way, it was your it was your disc touching on your spinal nerves. Yeah, so they were out of shape, and he said if you've had a bad tackle, he said that could have severed them. You know, like you could have split them yeah. like in half and that. And he said that would have been like you wouldn't have okay. so. And uh, you know, you look at that and you're thinking like, is football like worth that? It's not, is it? No. You know? <laughs> So, no. yeah, so that was it. So like, yeah, um, just had a bit of bit period of rehab, but about twelve months trying to get back, and I thought like, I'm not. I got advice. Like, I said, you're not going to be like, a, you're not going to be able to train every day and keep yourself fit and uh, play matches, cruising plays. Fine, not going to happen. Not not on a full time basis anyway. So, how did you get through? The, you know. This process, this next step of, you know, obviously the big setback at Man United, rebuilding, <laughs> you know, your, your confidence, your career, your identity again. Yeah. And then it, it comes back down again. You know, can you walk, walk us through and anybody who watches or listen, listens to this, you know, what were some of the things that you did to help yourself kind of rebuild? And as you said, like, uh, learn from... From you, from that experience to help you kind of grow in a, in a new way. How did you approach it? I think I think for the first for the first, it's like that model, isn't it? That grief model. You go through the denial stage and bargaining, you know, depression. I think there's different stages to grief, isn't there? Yeah. It's like losing a career, a football career, something that you love doing. You know, ultimately you're going through. It's like a death, isn't it? You know, you've lost something. You're never going to do it again. Yeah. And uh, I. Th- at a time after Rob, I just just completely lost. To be honest, um, I wasn't in the best of you know. My mental health was like one of the greatest because you almost go into denial. You just think you're like you're still a footballer, and you're like you know, and going to the pub. You had a bit of insurance money that I got paid out of from the football league, and and you just you just lost. You just there's no direction, and I weren't too sure where I was going. I didn't know what I wanted to do. Um, it, there was. Because the football club I was at at the time, Exeter, I, it was only small, like coaches, and you know there wasn't a lot of opportunities these days. It's like it's like a UN delegation on the bench, and that you got <laughs> strength and conditioning coaches, yeah. sports science. So if it would have happened now, like, you've probably got a better chance of maybe staying in the game. But yeah. you know, it was like a big door closing for me. And um, but like I say, it's just just lost for I'd say for about four years, to be honest. Yeah. Just picking up jobs that that I try, you know, van driving. I was doing a little bit of work for, uh, on a, you know, in, in the warehouse, a bit of warehouse stuff, and uh, 
to be fair, I did, I did try and play like a, a, a sort of love football. So I thought, well, if I could train once a week, play once a week, I might be able to manage that. And uh, I, I played for like a local side called Elmore for a bit, like down in the southwest. And then I joined a team called Cliss Roll. Was like again a reasonable standard. They had a couple of old Exeter Exeter pros and lads who I played with at Exeter playing for them. So that was a decent standard. Yeah. But it, it got to a stage where I thought, like, I don't know whether it's for me. I lost all the the desire and the yeah. love, and the, you know, and you, it's almost like you you come to this stage where you think, like, I don't know if football's for me anymore. Yeah, you, know, you, had, you had like an interest in it, but I think you have to love something to give it your all, don't you? One hundred percent. You know, and and I thought, well, I need to find myself opportunity to bring some income in, and uh, it got probably till I think it was twenty eight years old. I think it was a member of my family said, like, why don't you go back to university and do a course? So to be honest with you, I really identified myself as an academic. I was one of them at school where I wasn't at the back of the class throwing rubbers at the teachers and messing <laughs> about, but I wasn't at the front yeah. hundred percent in maths either, you know, like, like ridiculous exam scores. Like some of yeah. these that were probably professors of maths at Oxford or something. I was like in the middle group a bit, liked a bit of sport. I was I liked English. I was quite good at English. And, uh, you know, I remember fancy, like, why don't you go to, to, to do a dig? Oh, well, I'll go and inquire and uh, about it. And I went back to uni and said, like, you know, what, what programmes have you got? I said, well, we've got sports science. And, you know, it was that, I think it was the year 2000. So going back quite a number of years and it was new sports science degrees. You had to, it was half and half. You had to do sports science and leisure, you know, to make up the, the honours degree. So I did that. And then from that, Rob, really just, just picked up my education. Like a, I finished my degree and then I did <coughs> I did a year of teacher training. So I got myself qualified as a as a teacher. And uh, I managed to get a job pretty quickly after that, like lecturing sport at a college, which uh, which is brilliant. And yeah. then from then I've done like a master's degree in philosophy. So I've, you know, I've I've went into study. And then, like, just recently, I like, finished a PhD as well. So, Fantastic. Oh, yeah, I've got I've got to fifty years old, and I'm still I'm still find a little bit of something. You know, where is that next mountain coming yeah. from? You know, that you're looking to scale and uh, and you, and you're looking to climb. So, so yeah, it was it's been an interesting journey. So, I think I think the first twenty five years of my life probably football driven, a lot of football, a lot of football yeah. identity, and probably the second twenty five years probably education and you know, but but trying to link in with sport because our sport is like yourself from something that I love and something yeah. that you know I, I, I particularly enjoy. And not not just football, all all disciplines of sport. Yeah. You know, so that that's kind of like how I, how I sort of try to move my life on after coming out of of Exeter with a with a bad back injury. Yeah, very much kind of feels and sounds a little like my story. You know, really, you know that. that I was actually at university to do my initial degree that that the same time as you. I went in, I did my degree in 1999. And uh, yeah, it was, um, yeah, I, 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 you know, football did change, change for me, you know, um, when, because uh, as I say, it was large, it was injuries that I was struggling with myself. Uh, I was actually born with my, my right foot in like this. Um, it's a condition which happens sometimes where the, where the fetus sticks to the, the womb in the mum. So I've got a lot of random issues all down my right hand side. I've actually got a, an extra rib up here which sits on a nerve in my arm and all these things. And, and as you start growing up, by the time I got to 14, 15, um, you know, I do not I'm the same height as what I was that was what I was then, pretty much, and all that football with this um, kind of issue that I was born with. In the end, it, it, there was a lot of biomechanical issues that never got solved with it. But after the age of one, you know, nothing was there was you know nothing was was ever done on it. And, and even going back to the doctor for myself as a kid, like they didn't even. He didn't even put two and two together that I was born like that, and that could be causing what was going on at, at kind of fourteen. It, it took until I was twenty-two for somebody to even say it's that. 
Uh, and in that time, you know, I had six, seven years where I could barely play. I could, I, I struggled walking. I, I, I was struggling walking to school. You know, I was in that much pain in my shins. It, it would just, it created all these kind of imbalances, if, if, if that makes sense. And I was then still, as I keep trying to play football and things, and I went from just being a do something for me that just felt so like, it felt easy at times, you know, and I just, I didn't have to think about it too much. And then I was it, as soon as you're then playing with pain, the pain interrupts your pattern, your flow, you know, and, and it starts chipping away your confidence a little bit. And the fun, the love for football start, you know, kind of went, but I've always had this, love for it in another way and, and, and sport in general and as I say like, like I said at the start about that when one door closed another door opened it, I think in not achieving what I, I wanted to it just left this like I had this real strong desire to be a footballer but I, I was then able to kind of take that and put it somewhere else, where else in, in, in something else that, that I loved I, I genuinely loved I started to build a a thirst for just understanding the body. I loved being at school. I loved biology at school. I loved GCCP. I loved learning about the body. And then when I got to university, it was the same. I, I just loved learning about how it all, all works and how it all links together. And um, as you say, you, you've got to love what you do. And and then that you know that, that's one of the other things that often gets lost with with athletes is that. People see them on telly and they think of these like superhuman people without emotions and mental health issues and things like this. And because they paid all this money or whatever, do you know what I mean? And yeah. and they themselves start start to to lose their love and passion for the game. You know, that, that's one of the biggest reasons, I believe, and from what I've seen, um, which causes performance to drop, you know. That, Sport becomes too painful for them, and you know, not necessarily physical pain, but the setbacks, the the losses, the mistakes, the being dropped, the this, the that, the other, the comments. It, and in the end, it's almost like that seesaw. You know, it's pleasure, pain, pleasure, pain, and then I'm getting it's becoming more painful doing this thing that I used to love <laughs> than anything else, and then the, the the desire to keep doing all the the things that it takes to be an elite athlete, it, it goes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and, uh, and, you know, you, you've heard it, I'm sure, uh, recently, you know, you've got Paul Pogba coming out talking about how he struggled with depression. And I think even Ma uh, Rashford, uh, Marcus Rashford has, and, um, you know, the humans are all, you know, they just happen to be humans who are very good at football, but take football away, no different, are they? <laughs> It's like anything else. It's like the scrutiny that they get is like you say. Well, you get they're getting like well paid. Yeah, of course they are. But you know they, they could do ninety nine things really well. But the one thing that's kind of doesn't go well, like a bad touch or like you, you're labelled as useless. Or and you, if you're prone as a young person in the region of eighteen to twenty one to sort of go on social media and read these comments that are kind of coming through from you know, quite quite a lot of the time. Robert, let's be honest, it's from people who've never kicked a ball. I, I, it honestly baffles me that a lot of people who are absolutely criticising players were people who were last picking PE at school. You know, <laughs> like, like, what other industry has that, where you're getting these types going, he's pathetic, he's useless, blah, blah, blah. And I get that, you know, the, the fans and everybody's entitled to their own opinion. I understand that. But that, that's like me having a go at a surgeon or something who's like, and saying, oh, you've not stitched out properly, and you're garbage, you aren't you? And, you know, anything like you know, you've got sometimes you've got to stay in your lane, haven't you? And, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, you're right. I understand why a lot of you know footballers uh, have mental health issues and and uh, you know, struggling times because fo football seems to be one of them sports where you know the, the, the scrutiny is incredible. It's on foot, it's on TV 24 7, isn't it? It's, it's you, you can't escape it. That's probably one of the things that I found most difficult. It's all around you, people yeah. want to talk to you about it. It's in magazines. It's on the telly. Uh, you, you go out into the street, people are talking about games that are coming up, and it's like you, you can't escape it anywhere. No. I, I was laughing like it's, it's sometimes like you look at Man United and you think, if I, if I wanted to escape life and I said to Richard Branson, can you get us to the moon? 
you'd probably like fly me up there and somebody, there'd be a marching with a Man United shirt on or something. <laughs> I can't get away from it. Yeah. So, you know, so you've had, you've had all this disappointment, but you could never escape it for years. But I've, I've just tried to get like a balance to it and just accept it for what it was. But, you know, but it's like you say, you're absolutely true. The, the, the scrutiny and the, and the criticism that a lot get is like ridiculous, isn't it? Yeah. And this is why uh, I'm so passionate about, about what, what, what I'm doing is that I have learned a lot, you know, learned so much about the brain and the mind, um, way beyond what I ever, ever thought when I first looked into this. And there are techniques, there are tools out there for, you know, not just athletes, for people, but they're not getting out there. You know, what I've come across is that, you know, the common um, strategies to, to, to deal with mental health, they don't really work, you know. The common one is, you know, pop a few pills from your doctor. Like, how many, how many people, you know, no uh, disrespect uh, to that because, uh, you know, I've been there myself where I was at that point in my own life, to be honest. Um, I, I didn't go down that road. Um, and learning what I learned after that, it, it wouldn't... It, it was never going to solve the problem. You know, the, the problems that people have, they're emotional problems. Uh, they are, and all emotions uh, are being generated from your memories. And, and unless you face your memories, unless you face your, your heart, your heartaches, your setbacks, your mistakes, you know, unless you face them and, and find a way of dealing with that, those memories or that memory from the past, Unless you deal with that and come to terms with it, that thing will, that thing, all those things can haunt you for the rest of your life. And, and uh, I just don't think there's a, enough being done, especially with athletes, to give them the, the best possible chance to succeed and, and giving them the support, giving them techniques and tools. Uh, you know, I, I work with a, uh, a lad who's at an academy and he'd been around the houses, he'd been at Man City, he'd been at Blackburn, he'd been at a few places and I started teaching her, I'm only a teenage lad, I started teaching him some of my techniques and his, his dad was kind of, you know, I don't know what's the best word to use, is, but he was really taken aback by what I was teaching him and, and the impact that it was having. And he said, you know, my son's been at some of the best academies you, you're going to get at, Man City and Blackburn, they're not being taught this stuff. And I, I can't understand why, why they're not doing more. Um, and I know when, when Raniak first came in at Man United, within the first two to three weeks of him being there, one of the first things he did was bring in a mental performance coach, a psychologist. And I'm like, why is he only just doing that? <laughs> why do they not have a team of these people in there working with the first team, working right throughout, you know, all the all the levels because if you, if you solve um you know uh, self confidence if you solve that issue as a 14 year old then it's solved yeah. but if if you have self confidence issues based on whatever you know things happen in life if if you have it at 14 and you haven't done anything about it you're going to have that at 20 24 34 44 unless you do something about it and Something does have to change, and it is changing slowly. Um, and I'm sure it will become, a, you know, an even bigger part of football, especially and, and sport as a whole. Uh, but I, I still think that that sport as a whole is is really missing missing out on, you know, tapping into the mind and, and helping people understand it, and then. It's, it needs to go beyond understanding. It then needs to go beyond. And it then it needs to get to the point where people know how to deal with things. Um, so I'm hoping, you know, in the coming years and things like this podcast and things like this, that it, it helps bring more awareness to, to people to say you don't have to struggle. You know, there are, you know, there are things out there. There are tools or techniques that can help you, even if it's just simple things like, you know, meditation, that those, these types of things have become more mainstream, haven't they, or, or in the last five, 10 years or so, something like that. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, I, th- I think it's. I think you're right. I think. I think there's always space for education. Is that the improvement? Is it's a constantly evolving world that we live in. You know what was what was effective. You know, 10, 15 years ago is very ordinary today, isn't it? So it's always that you're always looking for that extra something. And I think I think you're right. I think it's about for me, it's about gaining an understanding of of the environment that a lot of these players are in mm. and what challenges that these players are facing. Um, I remember reading in a book about somebody saying it's not about an intervention or putting interventions in. It's a, it's about it's about trying to understand where that person's coming from, almost like trying to get into into their lenses, if if, if that makes sense, yeah. and and understand what they're uh, thinking at that time, or almost developing these deep psychological skills such as empathy and compassion and yeah. understanding you know, what, what they might be feeling at a particular moment. And I think football's a real, real, real strange one because the culture to me still lends itself to almost, you know, it, it's still that you don't want to show fear. You don't want to show oh, yeah. failure. You don't, you know, you put this, you know, look, you look at the Goffman work with the masks on I mean, We all put masks on as people in certain circumstances. Yeah. So maybe getting that something into a football club where there is a safe space to go and open up to somebody who understands you, who can give you those, like you said, those little tools, those those opportunities to discuss things that'll help them grow as a person and help them improve as a person to enable them to enjoy what they're doing, to stay in the game longer, et cetera, et cetera, instead of the environment through no fault of their own, almost closing them up a little bit. Yeah, because you're right. Once you get chucked out at the other end, you just end up as a closed person who hasn't a clue what to do next. And you know, it's like it's like it's like your growth's been suppressed for a little bit. Yeah. And then if it doesn't work out for you, it's like, well, I need to grow again to move on again. So you're, so you're right. It's, it's a constant challenge that I think environments have have got to look at, and, and education's got to look at as well, Rob. Yeah, definitely. And that, that, it, you know, the, the coaches, the managers, they need the education. It's not just the player, they need it. They need, you know, to understand more, you know, and, and you know, there's nobody, there's nobody on this planet that will not respond to that word, that emotion that you said, empathy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and in football, for a long time, that wasn't there, was it? You know, it, it, as you said, it was so, it was football, especially, and it would have gone on in other, other sports, it's so ego-driven, driven by, as I said, this uh, survival of the fittest mentality. You've got to be able to take it. You know, if you can't take it, what, what's that got to do with being a great a great athlete? You know, um, it, it's never going to, it's never going to get the best out of somebody. And as soon as um, somebody gets into a state of fear, and fear, when you break it down, it's anxiety, it's doubts, it's nerves, it's stress. All those things are the emotions that 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 that, that are driving into fear. And, and as soon as the the freeze fight or flight mechanism gets turned on, as soon as that amygdala in the in the brain starts going, there's danger here. And that's not physical danger. You know, the mind doesn't know the difference between what's real and what's imagined. And if it's a physical danger versus you know, a psychological danger, a threat to my identity, who I think I am. As soon as that comes into the mind and uh, an athlete starts doubting themselves, you know, stepping out on the pitch if they're a footballer and not being quite sure if, if they're going to play well today or, you know, I don't want to let people down or I don't want to make a mistake and get dropped for the next game. As soon as those types of thought pants come in, the, the, the freeze fight of fight mechanism is, is, is tuned in and no athlete in any sport at any level will ever play their best at that when that happens when they get in that state because it's it's the state of survival the state of survival and once the survival you know mechanism sets in you know the survival hormones kick in adrenaline <laughs> cortisol testosterone that is the opposite of of the flow state which is something that I teach athletes how to get into flow. And you can't be in the flow if you're in a state of fear. I call it fear versus flow. Um, 
and having the coaches that are berating you, nailing you, and even your teammates, they don't understand, you know, that those little sly backhanded compliments about making an error. For, for, for some footballers, they, they cut deep, don't they? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely, Rob. Yeah, you, you've explained it well. I think I think when you was a kid coming through football as a grassroots player, you weren't thinking about failing. You just you just did it, didn't you? You just you were just free. You just played, and then I think the more you progress in the game and you get into you know town teams, county sides, scouts looking at you into academies, you know, you, you, I think you start becoming a little bit more wary and a more awareness kicks in around what coaches are saying to you, and then. You know, I've seen it often. My son's come through grass football. Parents are, can be a nightmare as well. Yeah. Well, every, every parent has got the right to dream, of course, they have. But, you know, a lot of them think they've got the next Wayne Rooney on the next, the next Ronaldo on their hands. And, and they talk to him like that. And you think you do, you're doing the youngster more harm than good yeah. here. But, yeah, the, the further you travel up in football, I think the more sh- stress and pressure is around you. And, um, you know, and like you say, you have to have resilience, mental strength, desire, grit, you know, all these terms that we see in academic literature. But you've got to enjoy what you're doing as well. It's like you've got to, <laughs> it's great to have all that, but we've got to, what's the point in having all that stress and not enjoying what you're exactly. doing? It seems like a bit of a paradox, doesn't it, that? Oh, definitely. You can see that right now it's just written, you know, uh, with the work that I do, I, I spend a lot of time looking at, at physiology and the body because it's constantly in loop with each other. What the body is doing is being relayed back to the to the mind, and what the mind is thinking is relaying it back to the body. When you watch Marcus Rashford anywhere near that football pitch, whether he's on the bench or whether he's playing, anybody and everybody knows there's something wrong there, don't they? Um, and whatever it is, is certainly it seems like he's losing or lost is, is, is either love for football or love for being at that club. Um, and if he doesn't get that back, then he'll never return to what it, to that, that lad that burst on the scene. Like, what was it? Five, six, he, remember, I remember when England lost to Iceland in the, in the Euros and they were off, you know, the, the, the team were played in a complete state of fear, didn't they? That, that, that day when when Iceland got that like, equalised and it capitulated. But I remember Rashford coming on. I can't remember how long it was left. Maybe about twenty minutes. He came on. I think he was down on the left wing. And like you got all these like seasoned pros, the Rooney's, the Canes, these guys with a lot of experience who were buckled under the pressure big time. But he came on and like was like running rings around people, take, getting the ball, taking people on, taking chances, yeah. being creative, doing his skills. It's almost like looking around at all these guys far more senior to him, going like, what, what's the problem here? <laughs> what, what's happened? And he's fallen into that same rut himself. Yeah. I think a few weeks ago, Rob, there was almost that image of Rashford. I think he, he'd either been substituted, I think he got substituted in one of the, it might have been um, like a European game, and he he, he panned to him on you know Old Trafford where the where the substitutes sit behind the management. Yeah, and he just looked he just looked in a there wasn't something right. He looked almost like depressed. He's, there was yeah. no emotion on his face whatsoever, and yeah. and you're thinking to yourself, you know, you, you look you look as though you've got this air of melancholy about you. You just don't look right, and. No. And like you say, I think something's happened there where you've lost that sense of risk taking, enjoying what you're doing, believing in yourself. To someone who the flip side of fear, I suppose, can make you just play safe. Yeah. You no, know, you've no real uh, confidence, have you, in what you're doing? Your, no. touch, your touch isn't there. When you get the ball, you don't want to run at people because you've not got the confidence to beat them. Um, you know, and it, it, this is where, like you said, maybe somebody who's a specialist in that area, um, from a, maybe a psychological perspective, can maybe provide some guidance and help. Yeah. Them. Want to just take the pressure off the coaches and the manager. Yeah, he certainly needs it, and I hope he is going down that road with somebody because he has that. And that, as I say, well, 
<laughs> what I'm about to say here was the very reason why 20 odd years ago I started looking into this. He has all the talent. He has all of the ability. All that, all the physical stuff is there. It's done. It's there. Yep. So why is he not accessing it? Mm. And that is a mental reason. That is something to do with his mind. He's not able to let all those hours, thousands and thousands of hours, you know, there's that number, that 10,000 hours. I don't know how true that is. You know, there's a lot of yeah. people that go back and forth on that. But it's a lot of hours anyway, whatever it is, isn't it? And yeah. um, playing that game, when you've put all those hours in, you know how to play it. <laughs> it's, it's in there. The, the hard yards have been done. Yeah. And he isn't able to, to let that express itself. It's not a lot, it's, it, it's not coming, coming out of him. And, and that's what I just find yeah. a real shame, you know, with, with any athlete of, 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 of any age that I personally think, you know, that the reason why an, an athlete doesn't perform well or doesn't get to a high level, it should be because they're just not good enough. <laughs> Yeah. You know, they, did, they, they weren't motivated enough, they didn't work hard enough, they haven't developed the technical side of their sport, whatever it is, to go and perform at that level. And but often it's it and in it's 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 not that, you know, it, it it's a Marcus Rashford situation, but quite often that can happen when somebody's 16, do you know what I mean? And yeah. um for whatever, you know, I remember Another prime example of that is that Ravel Morrison, you know, gosh, that lad has had, you know, I think he's still playing, but everybody said, everybody tried to put their arm around him. You know, Fergie tried to get into moving with Rio Ferdinand. You know, they, they tried it all sorts because they knew that he had ability like very few had seen. Yet, it, it, a quote comes to my mind as, as I'm thinking that, a guy called Eric Thomas said it, you know, your talent takes you places that your character can't keep you. He had all this ability. He didn't have the character that, that could, could manage it. And Ravel Morrison, yeah, he, he certainly is somebody in recent times who, you know, who had amazing ability and kind of didn't, it didn't, didn't come to full fruition sort of thing. Yeah. But probably one of the victims, Ravel, in relation to when you're, getting into the first team and you've got that unbelievable ability, you know, you, you almost like your peer groups, Rob, the people that you associate with, you've got to be an athlete in the training ground and on, on in, within competition, but you've got to live the life of an athlete as well. You can't afford to be distracted. Can you? you've got to, you've got to have this focus, I suppose. And I think I've read in sort of one book that said that the higher that you're getting in life and, you know, it's professional football that we're talking about, Try and keep your life as simple as you can. <laughs> yeah. It's true, isn't it? But how, how many people find that hard? Because everybody wants a piece of you. You know, people want to to to, to sort of get that get you to promote their brands. You, you, you know, you're the you're an icon, you're the face of things, you're on the news channels 24-7. And to almost try and stay grounded within that is a challenge in itself. Yeah. And uh, you know, I think I think maybe. Marcus Rashford has done some fantastic things away from the game, yes. which, which has been unbelievable. But you have to be careful that that doesn't start impacting what got you there in the first place, if that makes yeah. sense. Yeah, it does, definitely. Almost, it's almost like you're taking too much stuff on Rob, aren't you? You know, he, he, you know he's done unbelievable. He's, he's provided all these meals for youngsters and families, which is incredible. You know, probably a lot more than the government have done. <laughs> Yeah, but then you're starting to lose your form on the flip side of that that got yeah. you there into the first place. And you know, I think I think some people have to look at themselves where you know what 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 is it that pleases you the most? Do you want a career in politics? You know, maybe because he's, he must be a wealthy young man now, Marcus. You know, yeah. you can make that switch if he wanted to, or is it you want to be challenging for World Cups and Euros and winning the Premier League with Man United and Champions League? Like, oh, which, which is it that you want to? You know, he'll be able to tell you that. He'll know that. He will, he'll, yeah. Mind his eyes, he'll know that. He will. But it's finding that direction again, isn't it? Yeah. I think, like, I think he's just got himself a little bit lost at the moment. Yeah. And, uh, and you know what it's like with fans, Rob. A lot of fans get a bit disgruntled and 
You know, they're paying a lot of money to watch football. And, you know, when you feel as though players are not playing for the maximum or they're out of form or, you know, to me, I've always been led to believe that if you don't play well, you shouldn't get a shirt. You've got to fight for that shirt. And when you get the shirt, you've got to fight to keep it. Yeah. Some players, especially in top level football, they seem to they seem to do what they want week in, week out, but then still get a start the week after. Yeah. And I, I disagree with that to an extent. And uh but I think I think he needs to think about his next moves. It may be maybe a little bit of a uh a refreshment, refreshing time. I think there's about six or seven Premier League games left, isn't there? Yeah. And then, you know, I think the World Cup this year is quite a unique one, is it? Yeah. In the around the sort of November, December time, isn't it? So yeah. You know, we we might have that opportunity maybe to get Marcus Rash freshened up a little bit over the summer and then, you know, put push on again. But it's what football life's all about, isn't it? Got to keep going and and ho- hopefully, hopefully, we'll find a bit of enjoyment somewhere. Exactly. That's what we're all after, isn't it? We don't want life to be stressful every day, do we? Or a bit a little pla- <laughs> a bit of pleasure here and there if we can find it. You know, on on that note, you know. We need stress gets this uh, too much of a bad rep. It does, you know. People see the word stress, and automatically the mind goes to a place about what they think that is. This human body of ours evolved through stress. It's been put through a pressure cooker for millions of years, evolving its way up through what we once were from from something swimming around in the sea to something that came onto land, that came to something pig-like, to something ape-like, to caveman-like, to something else. The only way we as humans are standing and sitting here now is through stress. That's what leads to growth. You know, it's like going to the gym. The only way that muscle grows is it's put under stress. But if you give it too much stress and overload it, the muscle or the mind, it will break. Yeah, yeah. You know, and, and it's that that fine balance of because if you try to avoid stress, you live your life in this box yeah. of safety, of comfort, and the, that is not a life worth worth living. In. And I know, I know people like that, and um, there's many people like that too scared to make a mistake. You know, which goes back into into the sport realm. Too scared. Let's play it safe when that freeze fight or flight mechanism kicks in when that amygdala starts getting a sense of danger you know if your self-confidence is low your self-worth is low the athlete will play safe but it will play within themselves they'll stop taking the risks stop being creative keeping it simple 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 never leads to success simple you know <laughs> playing it safe doesn't lead to winning the world cup it doesn't lead to Champions Leagues. It doesn't lead to scoring winning goals for Man United. Ronaldo never, never in his entire life has stepped out on the football pitch and played it safe. He won't have been in that place once. And that, that, that is one of the keys. No matter what everybody says about him, you know, a few weeks ago, People were criticising him, and I just I remember Carragher. I, I never, I, I don't like going on social media and saying anything really. They don't get involved us. <laughs> but Jamie Carragher done one of the things on Sky, and they put it on. I think it was Instagram saying now he's, you know, he's too old and he needs to be winding down. It's like he don't understand Ronaldo if that's what he thinks. And I'm not joking. I think it was two days later he then went and bagged an trick. Um. That's the mentality of the guy. He don't. He doesn't go for safe. He goes for broke. He goes for it. Michael Jordan, the same. You know, he Kobe Bryant, the same. Kobe Bryant. But if you're not in basketball, he has the unwanted record. Yeah, <laughs> in the history of the NBA, of the most missed shots in the game. He's missed more shots than anybody in the history of basketball. Yeah, he's one of the greatest of all times. Because yeah. he didn't let the misses affect his state. The miss didn't affect his self-confidence, his self-belief. Yeah. It's just a missed shot. Yeah. It's just a missed shot to these people. It's just a, a shot that didn't go in or whatever it was. And so he's able to then just keep confident, keeping that state of confidence, that state of flow, so he can just keep going and going and going and until 
it comes right for them. Yeah. I think I think like looking like just sort of picking a um some stuff out of what you've just said there, Rob. I think a lot of that lends itself to balance, doesn't it? So if you, if you think about it in a football sense, so we've come to the conclusion here that maybe maybe on one side of the kind of the of the of the level, like if there's too if it's too comfortable, yeah, you're not you can't really find that performance state that you explain, didn't you? Yeah. And then yeah. if you go if you go too uh, too far the other side where it's like riddled with anxiety and stress and pressure, and you said I think earlier about that can break you. Yeah. Now I think in a, in a lot of footballers environments these days, I think that it's too comfortable a lot of it. Yeah. It's almost like it's almost like let's strip stuff up, stuff some stuff away from them. You know, let them let them make mistakes. Let them uh, feel anxiety in order yeah. to grow. But we're yeah. petrified, and this this is not just football. This is across all things: education, Great. businesses, organisations. It's almost like everybody's got a rush to you. Aren't they? Are you all right? And you know, can I help you with that? And you know, that that's that's. That's fine, but sometimes you've got to just give a little bit of space for people to learn something. 100%, Alan. You know, find, find that little bit of anxiety where you can propel yourself to something else that can move you to, to something better. And I think, I think we're too quick to rush in as coaches, maybe, as managers these days to protect players. Um, so there's that side. And then on the other side, there's almost like, well, if, if it's too comfortable, if it's too opulent in a lot of academy football you're never really going to face that that opportunity to really dig in when you need to dig mm-hmm. in when you need to find something a little bit extra than somebody else so I think I think that brilliantly put Rob by yourself to me it just strike, strikes me as like this this thing that we're all looking for in, in environments is called balance isn't it it's getting it and all like the you know with your academic background you know like the inverted U stuff where there's a performance in the middle and if it's too far there, you, you'll underperform because you're bored or you're not up for it. And then there's on that side, there's, you know, you're too overpumped, you're too anxious, et cetera. But I think, I think you can just apply that as kind of a, as an holistic model for a football environment as well. Definitely. Finding that optimum level, isn't it? That, that's not too demanding of you where it's going to break somebody. You know, like the, like the Greek mythology about that Sisyphus pushing the, the boulder up the hill and then it drops down. He got punished by the gods, didn't he? And then he had to push the boulder up again. And you're thinking to yourself, a lot, a lot of the time in football, in life, is like, how much is too much? Yeah. You know, because if you're training and you're working hard and, and you know what a lot of people are like, Rob, look at athletes, look at boxers. You just got, there's so much grit in a lot of them. You yeah. go into danger areas where you're going to break your body or you're going to end up with a serious issue. But it can't be too soft either. So it's, I think I think in academic research, in coaching, in managing, it's about finding these optimum places, isn't it, to allow players to flourish, but not to be too comfortable on them either. But yeah. what, what a difficult balance to find. Oh, it, it is. Um, and that... But any... Um, any leader, whether it's in sport or not, they have to be the master of that, you know. And if they don't know that, and there's a lot of people, a lot of leaders that get in positions, that the things that we're talking about there, they have no concept of at all the, the environment. How much attention are they giving to the environment that they are in charge of creating? As soon as you take that number one spot, you know, the manager of Man United, for example, let's keep it in, in full sport and football. As soon as you step in that hot seat, you are your one of your key priorities has to be creating that environment, and you, and they need to understand how to create it. And if they don't understand how how that themselves, then it's their job. Then because you can't understand everything, you can't spin all the plates. Then it's their job to get the people in who who do understand it more. Um, like it blew my mind when I, when I was really kind of he- heavy in the re- uh, research that I was doing uh, on this one of the early one of the books that really expanded my mind on creating culture and an environment in a sports setting. I don't know if you've ever read it. It's, it's Clive Woodward's autobiography, Winning. That now that was that was that was paradigm shifting for the whole of British sport. Because after 
that he went also into the British Olympic Association and started embedding his philosophy across British sport. You know, so so and, and look what's happened to the British Olympic teams. You know, in the last twenty, we went from nineteen ninety six. Yeah, we won one gold medal. That that's what I remember. You know, I, I remember being a little kid watching the Olympics in nineteen ninety two. You know, Linford Christie. You know. <laughs> Chris Boardman, Sally Gunnell, Steve Redgrave, these, these people that David Thompson was coming to the end of his career then. But as a little kid, I was watching, you know, Linford Christie was what, my, one of my heroes. I was quite quick. I, I, wanted to, I wanted to be a sprinter like him. And I've, I, I just thought seeing that as you do as a kid that don't really know much, that, that we was just this amazing sporting country. <laughs> and then I remember being so excited because I got a bit, you know, four years older and for the next Olympics. I was like, day after day, I was like, where, where, where are all our winners? Where's the success? You know, it, and then you go from that to where we are now. We are punching way, way above our weight for the size of country that we have. What we are doing in Olympic sport is, it's, out, it's, it's outstanding. You know, and I know that Clive Woodward has had a, had an influence in that. And he was, as I said, a master of creating the environment, bringing people. He was bringing in eye coaches, people to train the players' eyes. He was taking the players to, uh, you know, camps in the summer with the Marines. And the Marines were putting them through battery of tests. And the Marines themselves, the, the, the people that was, um, I don't know what kind of level they were, let's say lieutenants or whatever, you know, the, he had them like evaluating. He took the 40 best rugby players in England and, and put them in a pressure. He put them in that uncomfortable environment. And then he had all these people within the Marines, right? Watch them. I want you to give me feedback. Who would you want to go to war with? Who, the, who Which men here are the one, ones that you'd want to be by your side when the proverbial hits the fan? And, and who would you not want? And he, and he separated them into energizers and energy sappers. Who were the people in this group who were lowering the energy, sucking this, you know, changing the state to a negative? Who who were the people that are raising their state, their own and, and other people? And it's just a it, you know, it's a fascinating book of, of somebody who just got it so right. And and Alex Ferguson was very very clearly of the say, same ilk. He had control, you know, look what's happened since United, to United since he left. He had control, he created an environment that nobody's been able to replicate since he left. And it happened with Liverpool, didn't it? When Dalglish left, they had that, that, that era from um, Shankly, Paisley, there's the other guy, and then it went to Dalglish. And it, it, the torch kept getting passed on, didn't it? And then when the Hillsborough disaster came and, and Dalglish went, everything folded in that moment, just like it did with Fergie, because the, the environment, the culture went. And with that went confidence, discipline, you know, that that that, that balance that we, we, we spoke about. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's true. I mean, it's, it's like the power, isn't it? Who's got the power? Um, I think there's too many people now Certain football clubs are trying to make decisions that they shouldn't be making. You know who who who's got the power in there, and when you get lots of people, so it's like that phrase, isn't it? Too many cooks spoil the broth. It all starts fracturing, doesn't it? And yeah, just because you had a good culture 10, 12 years ago, it starts get you get an unhealthy one now, where there's lots of scapegoating, there's lots of finger pointing, blaming. You know, it goes on like the bad side, and like almost like that. In the academic literature, it's like toxic cultures, isn't it? Yeah. So, um, yeah, some 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 great points, and and like you say, there's a there's a few good texts on culture, isn't it? The Woodward stuff, the, the le legacy is really good, isn't it? Like the New Zealand lads, just watching a program about them last week about you know they, they don't just want good rugby players, they want good people as well. And if you're not a good person, we don't want you in our environment. Yeah. You know, and you can pick up lots of different tips and lots of different ways how to how to do that from from that book of by Kerr, isn't it legacy I, 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 yeah I, I haven't read that it's something that I meant to touch on um, 
but but having a, one of the, one of the things that I do love about the, the the Kiwis is that you know arguably they were the greatest sports team in the, in the world for seven to eight years. They won back to back World Cups, didn't they? Yeah. And all of the, those players of that time, and it'll still be going on now. After every training session, after every match, the players themselves clean the changing rooms. Yeah. They sort out the environment. Yeah. They're humble. Yeah. They're not beyond picking up a piece of litter. Yeah. You know, getting the getting the, getting on their hands and knees, as you said, getting a bit uncomfortable. Yeah. It keeps them grounded, doesn't it? Yeah. You know, so if the greatest team in the world are uh, scrubbing floors, sweeping up. Yeah. Then what excuses has everyone else got? Yeah. Yeah, I think sometimes football culture is where it's like it flips on its other side, doesn't it? There's there's a lot look at the look at the training grounds now that they've got. It's like it's unbelievable, isn't it? It's like it's it's just it's just space age stuff, the facilities, the coaching, the the, the support, uh all the sports science stuff, it's unbelievable. But you you gotta be careful that like, you just don't get too comfortable with it. You look you lose that you almost lose that something, don't you, that, that drives somebody to excel. You know, uh, I remember, I think it was the uh, the lad at Brentford, I think he's moved on now, is it Rasmus Ankerson? He said he went around the world looking at different high-performance environments. He said he was absolutely blown away uh, by the Jamaican setup. He, he expected it to be, uh, unbelievable facility, re- reggae music, spas, you know, and he said it was just a rusty field with some old weights and and they've produced some of the greatest sprinters of all time. And uh, and, he, and he said that, he said performance environments should not be built for comfort. They should be built for hard work. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> there we go, definitely. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I've got two two, two last points, uh, Alan. Because I, I, you know, I've sat here with you uh, today. I'm, I'm enjoying it that much. I could keep going, but uh, <laughs> well. I better start wrapping it up, mate. Um, if if you could go back in time, you, you know, you, you had your career in sport all, all the way up until that kind of back injury, and even though it wasn't where you it wasn't what he was striving for. It wasn't what he was hoping for. But even throughout all that, all that time, from being a young kid to to getting in and fin- kind of finishing there at Exeter, you still had all these memories. You you you, you learn a lot. There's, there's wisdom within that, isn't there? Yeah. And with all of that gained, plus. What you've gained since with all of the research, your, your master's, your PhD, the work that you're doing in the, um, the university, the, 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 the teaching that you're doing now, if you could go back in time with the wisdom, the knowledge that you've got and, and speak to your younger self as a, as, a, as, a, as a kid at whatever age, 14, 16, 18, whatever it may be, what... What advice would you would you give to that version of you that would kind of help them move forwards? Mm. I'd probably I'd probably try and I'd probably advise myself to be more aware of where your development could take place the best. And uh, and what I mean by that, Rob, is I, I had a fantastic grassroots coach, probably one of the best I've I've, I've, I've experienced in my journey, and, and I've, I've I've had. I've been playing since sort of nine, ten, under elevens, all the way through to coming out of the game at early twenties, and uh, he's he's kind of one of these people, Rob. And I think we can all relate to these types that you never forget a good teacher, do you? You can always go back to your school days, and you always yeah. think, I, I got on with that person. Yeah. But they believed in me. They, they praised me. They they give me responsibility, and all all the things that should be happening, I had that at grassroots. Well, one of one of the biggest experiences that I had to deal with in relation to working stuff out was I got into United and I had almost like the polar opposite to that. I had harsh coach and I had somebody who didn't give a lot of praise, very cold, very you couldn't really approach them. 
So you'd gone from that to that. Mm. So what I'd probably pass on to my younger self would be be more aware of people and who gets the best out of you. Yeah. If you come through your schooling, Rob, you wouldn't say, say you had a teacher at school, Mr. Taylor or something, and he was very strict. You wouldn't go, oh, I'd love to go back into Mr. Taylor's class. <laughs> but what you would say, I said, I'd love to go back into Mrs. Wood's class because she believed in me, she asked me questions, she was interested in what I'm doing. And I think a lot of coaches are not necessarily the ones that are the most knowledgeable. I don't think it's the ones that are the most experienced from a playing perspective. It's the ones that believe in you the most, I think, bring you on as far as possible. Now, this comes with this, this lends us into different personalities and fitting and, you know, like some people get on with others, some don't get on with others. But I think that crop that Eric Harrison brought through, they all had a sort of similar personalities that he could shape and push them through. That's fantastic. And they're unbelievable players. And what they did in the game was incredible. But not every personality fits what he did. There was probably a lot of good players that he didn't get the best out of. Mm. At the, you know, so, so that would probably be my advice up to my younger self is that to be more aware of coaches who can get the best out of you, believe in you, who push you, who, who take you into places that's not necessarily comfortable but they won't abandon you. They'll be there by your side while you're trying to push on. And, I, I, and but I, to have that level of awareness at oh, fifteen yeah. is very difficult, isn't it? Yeah. I, I know it's a know. difficult question. I ask it on purpose, but there's a but lot of. Uh... I, I said earlier in the pod, Rob, didn't I, about you know it, it's sometimes your heart ruling your head on your choice to go to United. What was it the best for you? Maybe, arguably, it wasn't. But because you're a United fan and all, oh, get me in there and all that and. You know, you, you do it. How, how can you say to a kid anything in the region nine to sixteen? Or no, no, don't bother sign, signing for United. Uh, but Bolton are interested. In, you're not going to go. Well, I'll just think about the coaches there and what they do. <laughs> yeah. You're not. You're, you're not. You're, you're signing and stuff like that. And you know that that's probably the, the sort of the best reflective advice I can I can give on that. Fantastic. Last question for you then, Alan. What what's your definition or meaning of of achieving sporting excellence to you? I think I think the, the, the probably what I'd say there, Rob, and I think this is probably something that maybe I didn't do, and it probably hurts me still now. I'm 50 years old, and that is I didn't get the full potential out of myself. Yeah. And I think I think the definition for me, I think human beings are full of potentiality, but it you need you need people around you sometimes in my view to push you to get there and I think I think everybody's good at something it just needs time and patience and nurture and care and I think I think in football environments some will get that but some won't it's like it's like planting a seed Rob isn't it you don't look at the seed every day do you but you water it and you'll give it some light and then within maybe a couple of weeks there might be a little sprout appearing and then you keep looking after it, and then in a month, it might be a little stalk with a little leaf coming off it. And then within six months, 12 months, it might have bloomed into a beautiful flower. That, that to me, is all about youth development. It's having the time and patience, not within short-term stuff and expecting people to deliver immediately. It's about over a period of time. And I think one of the biggest failings of youth development structures for me is coaches, managers, you know, the environment doesn't give enough time to players to, to, to allow them to fully bloom. What a beautiful, what a beautiful answer, Alan, that, you know, I, um, yeah, uh, that, that really resonated with me, your answer there. I couldn't agree with it more. I think that's a fantastic way to uh, wrap up the, the podcast. And I'd just like to say, you know, thank you very much for, for giving up your time. I've, I've loved every second of this. And as I said, like, Kind of carry on going because um, uh, yeah, I think we see some similar things uh, about about sport and the environment, that sort of things. And yeah, um, just yeah, thank you very much for for giving up your t- your time, Alan. I really do a- appreciate it. Not no worries at all, Rob. Thank thanks so much for inviting me on. I've I've really enjoyed it as well. That's great. Thanks a lot. See you later. Cheers, Rob. Thank you. The Inner Game Podcast, brought to you by the Science of Excellence.
Unleash your power. Book your free consultation now.